Hello, welcome to Campbelltown Free Church for Psalm of the Week. And this week we're looking at Psalm 90. Let me begin by asking you this question, how old is old? Some of us don't think of ourselves as old, but our grandchildren probably have a very different take on our age. My first congregation, which was called First Tremor, uh, it traced its beginnings back to 1660. And I thought that was old until one year while in holiday in Scotland, I came across a church that had started in 1034. So how old is old? Well, today we're going to look at something that is really old. Psalm 90. It's a prayer written by Moses, the man of God, as the title puts it. So we're talking about roughly 1450 BC. This psalm is old, really old, probably the oldest psalm in the book of Psalms. So let's read it together. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are, are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They're like the new grass of the morning, though in the morning it springs up new. By evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? for your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendour to their children. May the favour of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Moses' prayer revolves around three convictions about God. And the first one is that God cares. That's verses 1 and 2. At time of writing, the Israelites had been promised a home by God in Canaan but they hadn't arrived there yet. They thought they had no home with no one to care for them. But how wrong they were. They did have a home, God himself. Verse one, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. Alec Mateer puts it well, Lord, you have been our fixed address. Physically, the Israelites did not seem to have anywhere to call home, but spiritually, they had a fixed address, God himself. And that God, who was their dwelling place, cared for them. He watched over them, guided them, protected them, caused them to grow numerically. He gave them his word. He blessed them with his presence. And when they forgot him, he never forgot them, constantly forgiving them. He kept all his promises to them, not all at once, but rolling out each of them uh, over time. God is a God who cared. And this God, who cared for his people in the past, cares for us in the present. As one generation came and went, God cared for the new one that took its place. This God who cares for his people is our dwelling place throughout all generations. He cares for us today as much as he cared for his people in the past. Uh, very often we find our, our, ourselves in a world that is uncaring and even hostile. And yet in this uncaring and hostile environment in which we live for Jesus, God cares for us. He is our dwelling place. And when we worry about our children and grandchildren, we really are getting old. We need to remember that God will care for them too, because God is our dwelling place throughout all generations. 
The second conviction about God around which Moses' prayer revolves is that God confronts. This is verses 3 to 12. In these verse, verses, Moses is taking, uh, taking us and confronting us with uncomfortable truths about ourselves, uncomfortable truths that he has already written about in Genesis 1 to 11. In verses 4 to 6, God confronts us with our frailty as human beings. Verse 3, you turn men back to dust, saying, return to dust, O sons of men. Moses is taking us back to Genesis 3, verse 19, and the fact that as a result of human sin, everyone will die. Verse 4, for a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by. We've landed in Genesis 5 with its long list of almost unpronounceable names. All of them lived long lives, but all of them, apart from Enoch, died. Even Methuselah, he might have lived a few years shy of a millennium, but compared to God's eternity, that was nothing. It was like a watch, a short segment of the night. And think of the image of verses five to six. Hydrated by the heavy overnight dew, grass in Israel springs up in the morning, but then the sun gets up and the temperature soars, and by evening the grass is dry and withered. We are frail human beings. We think we are invincible, but we are not. In verses 7 and 8, God confronts us with our guilt as human beings. We're under God's judgment because we are sinners by nature and practice. Our obvious outward sins, the iniquities of verses, verse 8, and our inward sins, the secret sins, uh, the sins we frantically try to cover up, make us guilty before God. We're under God's judgment because of our outward words and actions and also because of our inward thoughts, daydreams, ambitions, desires, lusts, motives, values, anger, bitterness, hatred and pride. God sees them all. They are all set before God in the light of his presence. Verse 8. In verses 9 and 10, God confronts us with our sadness as human beings. We do not live forever. In line with what he announced in Genesis 6 verse 3, God puts limits on how long humans live. The length of our days is 70 or 80 if we have the strength. Verse 10. But look and listen to how we end up at the end. With a moan, with a sigh, full of trouble and sorrow. It is the sight and the sound of something very sad, physical and emotional exhaustion. We're just done. T.S. Eliot ends his poem, The Hollow Men, with these lines. This is the way the world will end, not with a bang, but a whimper. In verse 11, God confronts us with our foolishness as human beings. Who considers the power of your anger? People seldom stop and think why things are as they are. And if they do, in their foolishness, they do not think it has got anything to do with God. When people look at common human experiences, God is never a part of the mix. The message never registers. They just don't get it. In our spiritual foolishness, human beings deliberately shut God out. In con the contrast between God's eternity, verses 1 and 2, and human frailty, guilt, sadness and foolishness, verses 3 to 11, is unsettling. But God's confrontation is meant to shock us, to wake us up. It's designed to get us to pray the prayer of verse 12. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It challenges us to live for what is lasting and permanent and not for what is passing and temporary. And it's also designed to take us to Jesus. In verses 3 to 11, Moses has been taking us on a very bumpy helicopter ride over Genesis verses chapters 1 to 11. Most of what he wrote is not easy reading, but there are chinks of light. And the first one is found in Genesis 3, verse 15. There God promises to send a saviour to deal with the catastrophic impact of Adam's self-centred rebellion against God. That saviour is Jesus, the last Adam, the second man, who by his death bore God's judgment on human frailty, guilt, sadness and foolishness. The third conviction about God uh, around which Moses' prayer revolves 
is that God is compassionate. We're in verses 13 to 17. The connection between verses 3 to 12 and 13 to 17 is simple. When faced with our frailty, guilt, sadness and foolishness, the wise thing to do is to pray, asking God to give us relief and help. There's nothing complicated about that. It's something that all of us can do. We ask God to turn things around for us. Verses 13 to 15. Relent, O Lord. Literally, turn back, O Lord. You're taking us in that direction, O Lord. Please do a U-turn and take us in the opposite direction. Life has been hard and difficult. Turn things around for us. Satisfy us in the morning with joy. And in the Bible, the morning is the time when God's when circumstances change, we ask God to even out our sorrow by blending it with some joy. Make us glad for as many days as you've afflicted us, for as many years as we've seen trouble. But it's not only our personal circumstances that are difficult. God's cause is facing difficulties. So we ask God to turn things around for the gospel. Verses 16 and 17. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your glory to their children. God's deeds are when he acts in compassion to save and protect his people. God's glory, what God is like, is seen supremely in the way he rescues his people. We ask God to do what we cannot do and turn things around for the gospel. We want God to do for his cause what we want him to do for us. Make us glad for the many days you've afflicted us, for the many years we have seen trouble. And yet in turning things around for the gospel, God calls on us to get our hands dirty. In verse 17, Moses speaks about the work of our hands. He's talking about gospel activity, prayer, inviting people to church, living a godly life, speaking to others about Jesus. We are to pray that God will bless our, our gospel activity. May the favour of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And even though we might think that our efforts don't amount to much as we pray this prayer and involve ourselves in gospel activity, on the basis of Jesus' resurrection, we have the assurance that uh, as we always give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord, nothing we do in the Lord's service will be a waste of time and energy. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. And that brings us hope as we get ourselves involved in gospel work. Let's pray. Eternal God, our dwelling place in uh, our generation as throughout all generations, Give us a heart of wisdom. Teach us that because you are compassionate, you have reversed your judgment upon us through Jesus' judgment-bearing death, and you now care for us. Teach us that you are with us, helping us in life's challenges. Teach us that you give us joy, gladness, and satisfaction. Teach us that because life is short and fragile, we need to focus on the gospel, your kingdom, and those heavenly matters that are solid and permanent. Eternal God, our dwelling place now in our generation as throughout all generations, satisfy us with your unfailing love and make us glad for all the days we've experienced trouble until that day when you heal all our brokenness and wipe away every tear from our eyes in the eternal kingdom of Jesus, your Son and our Saviour. Hear us because we come to you as we always do in his name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us for Psalm of the Week. May God bless you as you involve yourself in gospel work and may he establish the work of your hands.